Welcome everyone. My name is Jacqueline Biron. Today's topic is on contamination control. We'll be getting started right away, but we just have a few details I want to cover. The presentation is about 30 to 40 minutes long. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask them via the question chat function. I'll be reviewing all questions during the presentation and they'll be answered in one of three ways. Either I'll be responding directly during the presentation using the chat function. Drew will be answering during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation, and one of us will be contacting you after the presentation if we do not answer your question. Our presenter today is Drew McRae, who is Fluid Life's Reliability Solutions and Training Manager. Welcome, Drew, and I will hand this over to you. Thank you, Jacqueline. As Jacqueline mentioned, my name is Drew. I have about 10 years experience in the reliability engineering field. And uh, today we're just gonna do a pretty high level view of contamination control. And as Jacqueline mentioned, if you guys have anything more specific, please feel free to uh, reach out to us. So today we're just gonna go over uh, contamination and how it affects your asset life, how to identify the primary sources of contamination and how to reduce the effects of contamination. Now we have a little poll question I'm gonna give you guys and see uh, a little bit of your guys' um, thoughts on some contamination. So I'll give you guys about 30 seconds now to answer that. So if you don't hear from me, that's all it is. Okay, so contamination overview. So basically contamination and its effects. So what exactly is contamination? It's basically anything to make unfit for use by introduction of unwholesome, unwholesome or undesirable elements. The three main ways you're gonna get that is gonna be external, self-generation, or chemical. So in an overview, Cleanliness and contamination control are going to be your most important aspects of proper lubricate, lubrication for long equipment life, provided we have the right lubrication in the right place with the right viscosity and the right additive package. If you're going to take anything away from today's presentation, that, that will be it. Maximizing oil and equipment life by keeping your oil clean, cool, and dry. And when I say dry, what I'm what I mean by that is no mo uh, no moisture in your oil, so all all water removed as much as possible. And so most failures they're going to be attributed from some form of contamination, leading to corrosion, surface deterioration, and uh, those I'll go over quickly here. So overview, new equipment it's not clean. So to kind of give you an idea um how dirty equipment is um it's going to be anything under sorry anything that's going to be uh in your equipment be it dirt or metal shavings or anything like that all that all that's going to be in your equipment when it's new so um we talk about um your poll question there and how 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 the size of your contamination so if you have anything that's um 40 micron or smaller you're not going to feel it so one example we use is if you have a new vehicle and you immediately go get the oil change, you're probably going to see dirt and stuff in that engine. That's because of all the, all the contaminants that go into the manufacturing, be it the silica sand, any metal swarf, anything like that. And not only is new equipment not clean, new oil isn't either. So it's going to be very important and critical, especially in equipment such as hydraulics and large turbines, to have that oil really clean. So generally, oil is going to be dirtier coming out of your equipment than going in, but it's going to be a different kind of uh, dirt. So going in, it's going to be more of dust and grit versus oxidization products when you're um, draining your oil. So just to go on to how important uh, cleanliness is, uh, anything that the 10 micron and lower, that's going to be really critical in 
filtering out. So most of the time you can get filters that are gonna filter to about this size. So you can have about that much filtered out. And as you can see, the larger particles that they're filtered out, it's gonna increase the life of your equipment. Same goes for water. So obviously if you have water in there, it's not gonna be good at all. Um, 100 ppm uh, or less of water will give you close to 100% bearing life. So it's really critical to make sure that you have low levels of water in there. Now, some of you may have seen these uh, charts before, the ISO particle counts. If you guys read your sample reports, you'll probably see these numbers. And basically, I'm not gonna go too, too in far into it, but it's in the R4, R6, R14. As you can see in this example here, this would be an R, uh, an R, R18, R16, R13. So basically, what we call an 18, 16, 13, and that's because four micron and a greater is going to encompass all the particles that are four micron and greater, six and up, and then 14 and up. As you can kind of see how that trends. So obviously, the R4 is going to be the largest number because it's taking on all the particles. So OEM limitations. These are just very, very general rec recommendations. Flu Life doesn't have anything specific for manufacturers. These are just general uh, limits that we go on. You can go further into, into it and we're more than happy to help you with that. The biggest thing to remember though when, when analyzing the cleanliness is the load, the environment, the temperature, and the speed of your equipment. So sources of contamination, so the self-generated sources. Those are gonna be metallic wear, seal abrasion, chemical corrosion, oxidization residue, and oil insoluble substances caused by mixing oil. So a few types of um, wear that we're, I'm gonna cover is, the first one I'm gonna cover is adhesive wear. So essentially what happens in this case is, if there is no lubrication or inadequate lubrication between two mating surfaces, they're gonna basically weld together and they're gonna pull and stick, pull apart. As you can see, that's what the galling looks like here in this region here. And what I mean is you can see how the welding kind of occurs right in these areas. Now, if you look under a microscope at uh, the oil samples, you're gonna see these uh, long striations of metal. That's, so that's what, how we can determine that it's adhesive wear going on. Fatigue is more of a three body uh, motion. So basically you're gonna have a stress concentration that occurs here and it's going to, every time there's a revolution over there, it's gonna cause a striation and it's eventually gonna flake off. So you can see with this with this uh, element, rolling element, the flake it looks appears flaking, and that's what it looks like. So kind of what it would look like um, if you were to do a cross section. So if this is what it would look like, if you have a, a stress concentration here, you're going to get a striation every time it rolls over. It basically what metallurgy uh, metallurgists sorry refer to as beach marks. So basically you're gonna get these striations until eventually it's just gonna break off and then you're gonna get flaking like this. And sorry for my terrible artwork. Abrasive, it works kind of like a wood planer. So you can see that you can have uh, particles that get in there and they're gonna cause these um, round or not round, so these curling effects. So when I say using it like a a wood planer, basically when you use a wood planer, how you get those light and long, nice curly striations, that's what's gonna happen. So C-shaped particles, essentially. Chemical corrosion can happen a few different ways. Um, it can happen from water. It can also happen when you have in uh, additives that do not work well with metallurgy of your components. So a good example with this would be is if you have a worm gear and it has a, a brass component to it, a softer metal, EP additives typically have a active sulfur in them and that reacts with the copper in brass and would leach it out. 
oxidization residue, usually like a black or a dark brown, as you can see on these surfaces here. And it's basically caused by high temperatures, oxygen, wear metals, water, all those are able to increase your oxidization rate. A general rule of thumb, above 60 degrees Celsius, every increase of 10 degrees Celsius in temperature above that 60 will double the oxidization rate of oil. It'll essentially cutting the life of your oil in half. Now mixing oil, there's two, two different things going on here. So we'll talk about the one on the left first here. So as you can see, this is a metal container and it's a galvanized container and it just says lube oil. So what exactly is lube oil mean? So we don't know is essentially what, what the answer is. So you should properly label your containers with what oil is in there. You could be mixing who knows what kind of oils together. The other thing that's going on in this is it's a galvanized container. Galvanized uh, containers ca contain zinc in the, gal in the galvanized coating, and that will react with the oil. There's an additive called a, it's a ZDDP additive, additive, and what it does is it works as an anti-wear and antioxidant additive, and that will leach out and it could really affect the additive concentration in your oil. And on the right, this is two different random oils mixed, and you can kind of see it coagulates into um, just a, a big mess. Mixing of greases, same idea. Uh, grease is just basically oil that's um, suspended in a thickener. Uh, it's really important that it doesn't get mixed. Uh, you could have major equipment failures if you do. What you could do is this gun here, it's clear right here and you could just put these cartridges in there and easily read what the grease is. You could go one step further and you can see that this one has the blue on it and you could say that all all bearings have the blue the blue grease guns. All gearboxes have the green ones and for example red is for motors. So that way it's really easy to not mix up. And anecdotally um, we had a one of our reliability engineers go onto a site and do an audit. And he was saying that the maintenance manager installed a grease fitting that was connected to nothing on a wall, just an open area behind uh, the case. So basically no instructions were given, provided to the maintenance or operating crews. After several weeks, uh, that case was opened up and big globs of different types of grease were found in there. So it's really important to be not mixing greases as well. So using the wrong lubricant in in all sorts of different cases. So this is a whole other level. This is a tag here. I know it's a little difficult to see, but it says uh, a an SAC 220 oil. So this is an oil and this is a grease auto greaser. So two different ways of lubricating equipment and you're putting grease into an oil oil bath equipment, which can cause a whole other type of issue. External sources of contamination. So you're going to get these from a few different ways. They're going to be airborne contaminants, contamination caused by adding oil, contamination by adding grease, water ingress. Uh, even during uh, 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 repairs or overhauls to fix or, fix or mobile equipment, it's really important to flush your oil uh, at least five times. One example that we've seen with uh, external contamination is in a pulp mill, their place where they redo their, um, rebuild their pumps, it's just in an open area near production. So there's all the dust and everything in the air, as in the photo I'm gonna show you guys next, and they're rebuilding pumps. So before the pumps are even put into service, they're already contaminated. Contrary, I've seen plant sites where they had a separate sea can trailer that was just meant for rebuilding pumps. So there was a, a mill right in there and that was his job was to rebuild pumps in the sea can as it was a temperature, temperature and contamination controlled uh, building essentially. So the airborne contaminants, this is an example of air, airborne contaminants that are only visible to flash. I mean, you look at the light that comes in your windows in your home, you'll probably see dust particles. This is just 
a very extreme case of this because it's in a small plant and it's all contained. Now they've started the right thing. I know on the left you can kind of see some leaking oil, but on the right they have a they have a gearbox here that has a air breather on, which is very good that they've taken those steps. Now in this one there's a there's a lot going on in this example here. So first of all, Spartan Synthetic 220, it's a very expensive oil. It usually runs about two or three thousand dollars a drum normally. And uh, you can see that there's a bunch of silt and dirt on top and spilled oil on top of this piece of equipment. The cap is not on the spot. And what they had done, as 220 is a thicker oil to, to uh, pour, they actually just punched out the, the screen here so it caused less of a vacuum when they were, when they were um, adding oil to this piece of equipment. Clearly, they weren't using funnels or anything like that. Uh, but the best case thing to use in this case is one of those uh, breather adapter kits. If any of you had tuned into the uh, the sample um, sample taking uh, webinar, you would understand uh, you can buy these uh, adapters that just sit on top of that, and it basically you can sample and add oil as well as the desk and breather that's on there. And I'll, I have a couple images of one later in this presentation that I can show you. So this oil transfer container was sealed with the rag, and as you can see, that it didn't really do its job. Uh, there's a couple things going on again. This is another zinc-coated um, galvanized container. So again, the, with the ZEDP additive that you can get issues with. And there's all this junk in the bottom. So we are talking about uh, 40 micron is the smallest uh, smallest um, is you, uh, human eye can see, which um, is about the size of the cross section of a piece of human hair. So there's a lot more there that you can see. So what what is there that's going into that oil that you can't see? Now the technician had told me in this case that oh it's fine because we don't we don't uh, pour the oil out all the way so all the contaminants stay at the bottom. Other things going on with this one, same kind of idea using using galvanized containers. These were used to use for fuel. You can see it says the words gasoline there. And now it has uh, a 220 oil in it. They have different random containers. This one, it says 10W30 here, but it's hard to see on, you can't see it, but uh, in this one as well, there it was an EP220. So very different oils. Again, I showed you uh, what can happen when you mix oils. Uh, and then the most glaring one is the sunlight container. The uh, technician said they use this, they rinse it out really good, but they use this one because it can it can uh, get into small orifices easier. Now, I understand what he what he was going for, but you can buy proper oil safe containers that have uh, different size spouts. So contamination caused by adding grease. Now, I'm gonna try my best to explain this. I usually use this one in a classroom setting because it's easier with uh, hand gestures. But what happened is they would take this glove and they would scoop it out of these containers here and they would dump it in here. And often what would happen is they would have too much grease and it would pour down the sides as you can see here. And all they would do is they would scoop up that grease, scrape up the sides, and then they would pile it on the top and they would loosely place this lid on there. So what essentially is doing is this lid is kind of just sitting on a, on, on a mound of grease. So all sorts of incorrect things going on there. Now, I'm not gonna argue using um, gloves or not for adding grease to containers like this. I mean, you have to do what you have to do, but this one here, they could have just easily put the glove back into the container and you would be okay. Water. Water basically will destroy everything. It destroys your components, it destroys the lubricants, the additives, everything. So you're gonna see water in uh, a few different ways. So free uh, water, which will increase your viscosity. That's basically when you're gonna see oil, oil sitting on top of water. Emulsified basically kind of looks like this, cloudy in the mixture like this, and then dissolved you're never gonna see it. It's gonna be pretty impossible to see it. And the only way we're really gonna be able to detect it is doing a crackle test or a Carl Fisher test.
So as oil does ages, it oxidizes and oxidized oil means that additives have been depleted and water is able to be held in the water more. Now saying that, there's a lot of different ways of um, water getting into it. So if you have more additives though, you're more likely to hold on to water. So as you can see, hydraulic oils, clearly we do not want to have uh, additives or water in our hydraulic system, especially in Edmonton here, it can get pretty cold. You don't want your hydraulic lines and such freezing. As opposed to like a new motor oil, you want it to hold those at, you want the water to be held into the oil so as your engine gets up to combustion temperature, it can be burnt off. So built-in sources of contamination. So built-in or breaking contamination essentially. I kind of mentioned uh, at the beginning of the presentation about foundry sand with the pickup, uh, having a brand new pickup having its oil changed and finding silica and manufacturing residue things like that. Uh, re residue from cleaning agents like rag fibers. I'm sure most shops you guys work at have, have rags and even those small little fibers can have detrimental effects on your equipment. New parts installation or equipment repairs. I also mentioned about the, uh, the um, pump shops or, or the, um, the uh, yes, the uh, pump being rebuilt in, uh, in the pulp mill versus in a separate enclosed room. So there's many options for improvement. Now you don't have to jump right into it and drill right down to the component level. Uh, it's really best to start at a higher level. So looking at your fleet or your all your assets generally before deciding to put a one sample valve on one bad actor piece of equipment. It's better to go high level for this stuff. So receiving procedures. You're basically going to get your truck either bulk or in barrels or what, however you guys get your, your samples. Now it's really important to sample your oil and hold it and then have it analyzed and then and then go and be able to use it. Now what I'm saying that is it's really important because you don't know what was in a bulk truck before. It could have been carrying fuel and you don't know if that bulk supplier uh, purge that truck before they put it in. Um, perhaps your oil came in two different lots or two different batches. Maybe half the batch was manufactured in Edmonton and maybe half of it was manufactured in Sarnia. And two different lots of oil, you probably should sample both. You you would hate to put um, two different oils into a piece of equipment. One of the biggest takeaways as well is it's really important to filter at every stage. I know I say filter here, at this stage before putting into your equipment. But if you have the option, you should filter it after it comes off the truck in a bulk tank from your bulk truck to your bulk tanks. So what I mean there, there is before it gets transferred from a truck or a bulk supplier into your bulk tanks, make sure you filter it. And you can see these are really sophisticated machines. They're color coded, a little difficult to see the, the color coding on it, but it, they're color coded, they each have different labels, they are, they're all filtered before, and they even also have desk and breathers. Quick connects, all that good stuff. So storage, like here's a really good example of a, uh, of a um, loop storage. Uh, as you can see, there's uh, all the barrels are in a row here. And why they did that is it's first in, first out. So you wanna sample, you, sorry, you wanna consume your, oil, your oldest oil first. Now, oil has an extremely long half-life, but additives do not. It's really important to make sure your additives don't start settling out or, you know, there's moisture in the air. You're going to get, it, oil is going to naturally oxidize. It's going to, all these things are going to happen, right? So you can see that they also have the filter station on the wall with quick connects. Here's another example of something, if you're on a more remote site, you can basically get a converted C can and do this, or you could even convert a C can yourself. I've seen this on sites before where they've bought a C can and turned it into one of these. As you can see, there's different colors of bulk tanks for different oils. Right here you have different colors that would be associated with this one here, yellow, 
associated with this one and then like green that kind of thing and you can see that they're all have their filters as well what's nice about this it can be temperature controlled it can be locked so only the right people are in there so handling kind of showed you these two top ones already but these are examples of all things we've seen on site my favorite is the bottom right and using an old fuel container for sampling or for adding oil now there's a couple things going on it's it's not the right container to use uh the spout is just open atmosphere and dirty and it's right beside a it's oil tank that it's getting its oil from and it's just all it's just it's open to contamination you can see here as well sorry right there you can see that it's open to contamination open to contamination so this is a really good example of good practice. As I was mentioning earlier about using different um, um, sizes of um, sampling, sam or sorry, uh, top-up containers, instead of using a sunlight detergent container, like this one has a very small spigot on it. Uh, all the colors are matching. So your filter station and your container all match. You can see in this case where they have two-stage filtration, which would be a 10 and a three micron. And they also have desk and breathers attached to QuickNX, which then attach to QuickNX on the top up containers. Grease is just as much of a bad one as well. This uh, example here, this was this was actually taken by one of my colleagues a few years ago. And I went back to that site uh, recently and they said that grease gun is still there. They know exactly where that grease gun is. They could walk me to it. Uh, they just said it's there just in case you we need to grease, top up something with grease. Now, a lot of situations going on there. That grease is well past its expiry. It's clearly contaminated. Um, easy enough to just take that with you and have one of these proper grease guns like I mentioned before. But if it's a piece of equipment that you don't have a chance to go and see much, an auto luber is a good idea. Now, now, that being said, you still need to go check on the auto luber to make sure that there's grease in it or the batteries haven't died. Exclusion is pretty important. I kind of mentioned before about that uh, tank that had the Spartan 220 oil spilt all over it. This is an example of what you could put on there. This is these breather kits where you have a quick connect as well as a sampling port that grabs the oil from just above the sludge line. So the best place to uh, sample from. And it could easily be uh, put on this piece of equipment instead of a smashed up uh, lid like this. Now, these breathers are uh, basically meant to um, wick out moisture that go into the equipment. Or if you have a, a dry, air, um, dry air mover attached to the to your piece of equipment to dry the heads, the head space on your oil oil tanks it'll also help push the moisture out so uh as it as it turns pink uh that means that the oil has been uh is sorry goes from blue to pink sorry so as it turns from the color blue to the color pink uh, that's indicating the desiccants being consumed now you can buy ones that are disposable and you could also buy ones that are rebuildable so i'm just going to touch on filtration on in this presentation uh Filtration would be a whole other webinar that uh, we are possibly looking at doing in the future. Um, so goal of filtration, improve your oil dryness and cleanliness, help optimize your oil's usefulness, improve reliability, uh, productivity of your machine and pay for it. They can really pay for themselves in a short amount of time. Now you don't need to uh, get really sophisticated and have online filtration systems. They're nice, don't get me wrong, it's really good to have them, but it's really easy enough just to wheel your barrel of oil out to your piece of equipment and filter that oil through a filter cart as you put it into the machine. You could even leave that that uh, filter cart there permanently as a kidney loop filtration system that you turn on once in a while. Filtration is really going to be key to maximizing your, the cleanliness of your oil and your equipment. So there's two types of filtrations. Really, there's going to be the the surface filtration and depth filtration. Surface is kind of the, those ones where you more see a canister that you drop the filter into. It sucks through the middle and uh, puts the clean oil out the out through the uh, filter media on the outside. 
So the more pleats and the deeper the pleats, the better the filter and the more surface area resulting in cleaner oil. In this case, on the right, more of a depth filtration, different type of idea, the oil goes in and it's filtered out through the middle. And yeah, it just goes through the different discs. So same idea, just different uh, types of different concepts. So moisture, there's numerous ways you can remove moisture by filtration, centrifugal, coalescent, desiccant, uh, headspace air dryer. That's kind of what I was mentioning where you can work in conjunction with the breather where you're basically blowing the dry plant air into the into the um, equipment's head head air head air space, and then it's just pushing out the pushing out the moist air through a desk and breather. So today, this is just an overall of uh, what we're looking at. So looking at look at the cleanliness charts and that are set up for your oils. That's going to be the biggest thing. Uh, we kind of mentioned those those uh, ISO charts. Monitor your oils cleanliness on your sample results and trend to see what's working for you. I understand in some cases there's going to be dirt that you're never going to get rid of and we can help adjust with flagging limits in that. That's something that service we can help you provide. Uh, using proper lube handling procedures, uh, filtering new oil, filtering oil in the machines constantly. So these are all things we can help you guys set up if you guys need help with setting up routes, setting up uh, uh, loop procedures, we can help with all that. And I'm just going to quickly show you some of that. So there's lots of different uh, ways, like some of the uh, documents that we went over. Uh, there's, for example, the ISO charts, if you want to see uh, sources of where your, um, your metals are going to come from. These are all available to you. If you guys need help with sampling procedures, these are all available. We can also help you with all that. There's sampling kits, all that kind of thing. We also have the ability to come to your site and do a do a scorecard, for example. And that basically we can help you see where you're sitting right now. Are you sitting at a at a on a scale of one to ten? Are you sitting at like a, a six? Or are you really more of an eight type site? We can help you with your sampling techniques, your storage and handling, all that. Give you guys our expert opinion with our team of awesome reliability specialists. We can even help you with an oil analysis audit and tell you where, when, and how to sample and what sampling, what sampling, or sorry, what testing products you should be using. And same with greasing audits. We can help you with that. They can help you, are you over greasing, under greasing? Are you greasing the right stuff? If you need help, as I mentioned, flagging, if you're susceptible to having potassium in your oil all the time because you're working in a pulp or in a uh, potash mine. Uh, that's something we can easily help you with setting flagging, flagging limits. If you guys need help developing loop procedures and SOPs, again, something we're very capable and have a great team that can help you with. Well, I will turn it back over to Jacqueline now for any questions you guys may have. And thank you guys for taking the time. Thank you, Drew. Um, we will open up for questions now. Um, I do see we have one question here. Um, what is the proper way to clean a container if you want to start storing different type of oil in it? So if you're going to reuse a container to use a different oil, my recommendation would be like at least a five to ten time um, flushing with that new oil. So if you're going from, we'll say, a 10W30 to a to a, um, a 220 oil, I would suggest cleaning that at least 10 times and flushing. Now, you don't want to be using an old, something that, uh, um, a, um, for example, the one where the uh, we use that, we sell that Castrol 10 W30 oil, you would never want to reuse anything like that, but a proper oil safe container, if you flush it five to 10 times, that'd be fine. Thank you, Drew. Um, and I do have one other question. Um, are there any types of rag materials that are more likely to cause contamination? The ones that I've seen that cause more contamination are those ones that you buy in the box and you basically you you punch open the uh, the end and it has a random pieces of uh, clothing in there. Those are the bad, the probably the worst actors. Um, 
my recommendation is just a lint-free cloth, something like the uh, those lint-free shop towels. I've seen those used. I was I saw those used in a power plant before, and the reason I asked them why they're using those ones, it says that they have found that they they put they produce the least amount of lint. Perfect. Um, I do not see any other questions at this time. Um, if there is other questions from anybody, definitely feel free to email or call, and we will definitely get those questions answered for you. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. This is part three of our three-part mini session. We are hoping to have more for you in the near future, so please watch for posts and communication from us soon. Also, check out our website, bluelife.com, for any additional training we may be able to provide for you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.